1936. All these people are 73 years old. And you can see there's a, a large amount of variation in the, in the just, just, you know, you don't need to be a neurologist to see there's a huge amount of variance in, in, in the health of their, of their brains. Um, so this, I could get the laser here. Uh, this person up the top here is, uh, I've got hardly any space. So when, when you're young, the brain tends to fill up the whole of the intracranial uh, cavity, right? So this person here has got hardly any atrophy of their brain. Their brain's uh, h hardly shrunk at all. And, uh, and, and doesn't have any of the white matter hyperintensities, which are these areas which appear um, uh, very, very bright white on the, on the, the, the FLIR uh, brain scan image and, uh, and, and might, be, might indicate, they're, they're kind of like scars that appear in the brain and they might be related to um, vascular disease and small vessel disease, which uh, is related to risk for stroke and, and, and also dementia. Um, so, uh, you see this person down here has very large white matter hyperintensities and, uh, and has had a fair amount of atrophy. This person had a great deal of atrophy of their brain um, uh, as, they've, as they've got older. You hardly ever see any white matter hyperintensities in, in young uh, people. So it's, it's, it's the case that this person has, has aged faster than, than, than this person. Read your books. All right. Oh. Get rid of that and switch the Discord screen. Okay. So, uh, welcome to another episode of RYB. Today we're talking about a short little book about IQ and intelligence written by Stuart Ritchie. Uh, the title, Intelligence, All That Matters. Uh, not, it's, he's not like a, a hardcore like IQ crazy man. He's just uh, trying to talk about the general literature. But he has this title, which is kind of like a bait title to get people to read the book. And he talk, he does it that again uh, elsewhere in the in yeah, the book, which is funny. Chapters are like that too. Yeah. Okay. So so he he like you know t t makes a little joke about uh, journalists using provocative titles to attention grab, and he does the same here with his book. But it's mostly just a, an overview of the literature. And there's a certain aspect I found funny, uh, which was uh, so he goes over all this stuff about intelligence and IQ. And then, and then he like spends a, a, a number of pages trying to sidestep the race question landmine, and, <laughs> and yeah, he does and, that a lot. And the it's just so poorly done. It's it's hilarious. It kind of I don't know. Well, we'll talk about that. All right. So let me get my notes up. Let's go. All right. Chapter one. I I forgot the subtitles. I didn't put them down in my notes. Hold on. Let me pull up the book. Uh, Intelligence. Yeah, all right. So introducing intelligence. Uh, so chapter one mainly just goes over definitions. He goes over his personal definition of intelligence, which he borrows from uh, some more recent psychologist. And then he talks about sort of the history of measuring intelligence. So, you know, you got Francis Galton. You got a follow-up by James Catelli and then Alfred Binet. And then finally, uh, Louis Terman. And a bunch of other people as well, but but mainly those, uh, and and how it sort of developed originally from this very uh, Victorian social Darwinian uh, like macabre interest in measuring people's intelligence, and then developed into trying to help kids in school and stuff. Uh, and, they, and he sort of tries to downplay uh, the, the relation of intelligence testing to uh, the eugenics movement. Well, which is funny because it's like very heavily entwined with the eugenics movements back in the early uh, 19th century when it started. So, uh, intelligence was seen as a characteristic, but not all that important before the early 1900s. And there weren't any tests that really measured it. I mean, people just sort of said, oh, okay, you're smarter than this, per this person, or you're smarter, you're dumb. That's about it. And then uh, 19th century, they started doing, trying to do science on it. Francis Galton had a, a sort of anthropology study thing where people would come and he would interview them in depth and he tried to measure intelligence when he was interviewing people. And he had a good amount of data on that. And then after Galton, uh, James Catelli also tried to do sort of uh, in-depth tests to measure people's capabilities in, in sort of pattern recognition and uh, general intelligence. And then after that, uh, the somewhat humorous uh, French development of Alfred Binet, 
uh, Alfred Binet wanted to help school children who were having trouble in school. And so he devised a test to uh, determine what children have trouble with. And uh, he gave the different categories, four different categories for the children, uh, them being uh, uh, debil, imbecile, and idiot. So they had, there were different, <laughs> basically different ways of saying retarded, and they meant different things. So like if you're, I can't remember exactly, but if you're, you're like an imbecile, then uh, you can do like basic eye tracking, but you can't, you, you like can't pronounce words and, and things like that. So it was, and, and the author like remarks, it was kind of funny that, that these were the official categories used by the guy. Um, and they were sort of trying to measure moron. what, what yeah, one of them too, I yeah, a debil is the the French word for moron, I guess. Uh, yeah. And so they they were trying to measure like, okay, what is a kid bad at? What is a kid good at in terms of learning? And uh, I had, they had these unflattering titles, but that was sort of the goal. Um, all right, and then following up on Benet, World War One started, and then Louis Terman uh, devised a bunch more tests for the U.S. Uh, where they're trying to test people's IQ going into service, like when they're drafted or volunteering. So you can assign people to uh, either being... Looking for officers. Yeah, either being officers or, or special duty or just infantry. So, so military applications uh, drove the first, like, sort of comprehensive uh, IQ test. And then, yeah, and, and Lewis Terman, the guy who did that for the military, is the person who termed the term IQ, intelligence quotient. Uh, yeah, so they, they were used in the military way, and they're still used. And, and the MEPS, which is the current modern military test in the U.S., remains a really important measurement of intelligence, despite it not being dressed up that way. Um, all right, so then, and then at the end of the chapter, uh, Richie sort of tries to downplay the whole eugenics connection. He mentions Galton himself invented the term eugenics, and then there was a bunch of other people in Europe and the U.S. who were trying to use intelligence testing as sort of a, a a baseline to help their get their eugenics politics off the ground, which is interesting. And he he says that like oh well people say any for anyone who like likes IQs is a eugenicist, which is funny. <clears throat> he All breaks right. it into uh, positive and negative eugenics. Really. Yeah, yes he does. He talks about it briefly. That's not really the point of the book, but. Uh, he definitely tries to sidestep at any possibility of being seen as supporting of eugenics. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of funny. Like, yeah, it's, it's sort of in this book, he, he's going over all the hard data, all the studies about intelligence and how it relates to things. And then he, he has to, like, backtrack constantly to sort of apply, okay, this uh, intelligence is hereditary, but I don't mean in that way. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's really ridiculous, and he, it, you can tell it's just tacked on. Um, <laughs> all right, so chapter two is uh, talking about how the IQ tests are assembled, and there is a, a, a sample question in that. And so th did you guys solve the question? I just want to know. Did you guys oh, do yeah. that? All right. The uh, second one took me a, a, a bit. No, yeah, it took me a little bit with two, but all right. So uh, did you solve it, Psych? Uh, or did you have to look at it again? Yeah, I have to look at it again. It's the one with the, the line and the, the squares and the circle and the triangles and stuff. It's basically straight out of a Raven's matrices. Yeah. Matrices. Hold on. Are you pulling out your copy? It. Yeah. Hold All right, on. I'll, we'll wait. I, I just I, I know uh, the stream would want to be humorous for them, so well, let's pull yeah. it out and then answer all at once. Yeah, hold <laughs> on. Give me a minute. All right, so so while he does that, so the the he goes over how IQ tests are not like they're not writing random questions about uh, pattern recognition or, or verbal intelligence or anything. Uh, so they they make test banks and then they take the questions from each testing that are sort of uh, uniformly answered by people who are already smart. Uh, which I, I guess you can argue about what that does. And sort of the implications of that if you really got down into it but uh, I, I guess it's kind of solid so like if someone if a question can be answered uh well by someone who is ha would have an high iq and and it doesn't require like a specialized knowledge and it's it, it stays the high it stays a high answer rate a high correlation among many test takers 
then it's a good question. They put it in more tests. And that's sort of how that sort of filtration is how these IQ tests are assembled. And, uh, and so it's trying to measure what uh, Richie calls the G factor or general intelligence. So uh, he goes over how he, even if you have like a, a question that say, ha, look at a light and follow it with your eyes. Uh, and then, and then do another question, like say the, the, the pattern recognition or the, the folding, the piece of paper kind of questions, that kind of thing. And, and, uh, people would be, it doesn't make sense that people who are, just have good response times of like following a light would also just be really good at, um, uh, at, at these sort of other questions. But it, it tends to happen in the testing that there's what he calls a positive manifold. So if you're good at like, uh, a few things you're basically good at all of them and if you're using the right questions the questions filtered in this way uh then you're getting at this general intelligence idea so there's not really specialized intelligence i mean there is specialized intelligence he talks about it briefly but but general intelligence exists and it's sort of there's different hypothesis on how it exists he also talks about it in this chapter so he talks about how okay so so why would somebody be good at all of these questions despite the different ways that they're done uh, and, and one hypothesis is, okay, the brain, brain processing speed. So if your brain is really fast at figuring stuff out, then you're going to have a high IQ, and then you'll be able to do all these things really well. And then the other one is working memory. So if you, if you have a big short-term memory that's very accurate and able to recall, recall information very quickly, uh, then you'll be also be better at like all things uniformly. And so these are the two sort of hypotheses that uh, he talks about. He doesn't he doesn't favor one or one over the other, but uh, he he does believe that general intelligence G factor is true. And he also talks about briefly uh, S factor or or spe uh, specific intelligence. That would be like you know very specific tasks that are trained or 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 skill factor. Yeah, skill factor that ta tackles certain parts of cognition. So there there are very. Um, specialized parts of cognition but there is a general intelligence a, a sort of a general ability to do a huge variety of of uh informational uh, decoding tasks uh that remains true and is testable and that's what he asserts and he talks about all the the data that goes along with that uh psych did you get the the um your copy no it's on a uh, amazon kindle and it's charging right now just skip it we'll come back to it all right uh, maybe my speaker or guest volume you just are a little quiet. Uh, I think, yeah, let me just turn Mo up. I mean, I can get closer to the microphone. Turned you up a bit. Oh, right. I think Sykes fine, but Mo's a little low. All right. What is uh, getting late? I don't want to be yelling. Yeah, that's fine. Understandable. No need to yell. I turned you up on Discord. Can, uh, can you guys in chat hear him pretty well? Hello, check one, two, three. The Jeff Show, basically. Observing reality is bigoted. Maybe so, but compare pics of people with Down syndrome in Mongolia, large lips, fat faces, oof. All right, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about the race stuff later. That, that, we'll get into that. Um, so anything else you guys wanted to talk about uh, Chapter 2? Um, well, I was just happy to have a direct pointer to the... Um to the uh, critiques against the multiple intelligence, the, the bullshit. Yeah. Of Gardner. So, yeah, I like that part too. So basically... Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to read that paper, but I haven't yet, though. He talks about how the positive manifold effect, which is that if you're good at one thing, you're, you're basically good at all the things on the IQ test, kind of disproves that there's this, oh, well, this person's good at, at spatial intelligence. This person's good at this, and people could be really it's specialized. It's not even that it disproves it. It's that the guy who put forward the multiple intelligence theory doesn't have any proof for it. It's just, yes, it's, it's a sort of like, it's, it's my feels, basically. Yeah, and I ran into it in school, so that's... Oh, yeah, everybody yeah, everybody so in our in the in the sort of liberal intelligentsia does that. And even, although the author himself is, is a libcuck, he does complain about it, because he, he's, you know, researching intelligence and the, and the libcuckness is getting in the way all the time. And so even he complains about it, despite being a, a liberal. Um, yeah, and the other thing he talks about in Chapter 2 is the, uh, so over time, and I, that was the clip I used for the, the intro as well, is that your intelligence has a, a, a sharp drop-off. So uh, after the age of 25, your, your sort of learned intelligence, your, your sort of skills and, and competency stays. 
but your your like speed at processing things and your ability to do like new intelligent things drops off like a fucking rock. So like after twenty five, after basically after thirty, it starts plummeting, and uh, your your intelligence is going to drop. And there's different methods. Like you, if you're really if you work out a lot and you eat healthy and do all these other things, then yeah, you'll probably maintain your intelligence at the old age. But for for on average, it's going to drop like a, like a ton. And so, so keep that's that in also mind. Also dependent a lot on the um, on the on, genes on genetics as well. Yeah, in, yeah. yeah. I think you mentioned SAPOE here as well. It's that's the Alzheimer gene. Yeah, yeah, and and the the different genetic uh, research about intelligence also sort of ties into solving those diseases about Alzheimer's and other things until late age. And he talks about that later. Um, all right. So we we talked about chapter two, chapter three. What was that? What was the subtitle? Why intelligence matters. Okay. So he and then he just sort of goes over the the general utilitarian. All oh, intelligence is good. So he talks about um, that. All right. Yeah. If you're smart, you'll have be more successful in schools. And this this is just true and and pretty obvious. You know, it's kind of the most obvious point. If you're if you're intelligent, you'll be able to do all these random tasks that schools make you do. And uh, and then he talks about how the different. Uh, sort of libcuck uh, school teachers and other people are like, oh, that you can't say that people can be summed up by IQ and all these other things. Uh, but really, education does just come down to intelligence. Now, he does mention um, that even if you have a high intelligence G factor, if you're poorly socialized or if you're unmotivated, it doesn't matter. Like, like if you're if you if you're just like some fucking big brain nibba, 170 IQ savant. But you go to school and just like you don't care and just jerk off all day, uh, then you're not gonna do well in school. Like you're, if you just don't do the tasks, of course. So uh, yeah, and I, I would guess you could probably make another uh, measurement that like like the difference between IQ and and grade attainment. Like if you you look at that that uh, that differential, like how high is your IQ and then like how low is your grade, and that that sort of gap is probably how lazy of a fucker you are. Uh, and so that could be like a laziness measurement. <laughs> that kind of, that's kind of what conscientiousness is yeah. in the big five, but not not completely. Sort of, it's kind it's of. Kind of. Yeah. But yeah, but like, I think uh, an interesting measurement is the difference between GPA and IQ. So it's sort of how attuned you are to society, how motivated you are, how much of a nihilistic lazy fuck you are. It can be measured by that, I think. Because um, really, if you have an IQ, school is fucking easy. You, it is really piss easy. Oh, yeah. And uh, and you, you usually don't have a good excuse. I mean, sometimes people do, but uh, you usually don't have a good excuse. And if you have a shit GPA, you're, you're a lazy fuck, um, or you or you just hate, or you're just a nihilist and like deny all of society, which is fine. Um, uh, so other data he talks about is people hiring. So uh, so it's interesting data on that, like the different hiring uh, metrics, mainly. Specialized uh, jobs and the military have the highest correlation with IQ. So if you're like doing a, a complex job, or you're or you're working in the military, IQ matters a lot, and it's going to help your job performance. If you're doing a shitty job, it matters a good amount, uh, but it's not as important. And then uh, somehow leadership is like below is like the lowest. It's like below point three or something. Uh, apparently, you can be just you can be a leader without while being a complete retard. And I think there might be something wrong with the measurement there. Uh, about, like, about leader effectiveness. Maybe, maybe I'd have to look into methodology of that particular study. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see some other quantifications of that because that's... I mean, it doesn't make any It doesn't make any sense. Like, how do you measure the right. success of a, of a leader? Like, how people like them? Then then maybe, I guess. But if, if, if you look at, like, broad macro success at achieving goals in a company or, or any sort of setting, then it, it definitely you would need IQ. So I would, I would imagine that, that there's some methodology problem with that. But... But yeah, basically, he just takes out the data that says, "Oh, if you have your high IQ, you're gonna have good job performance." So yeah, that that's a a good normie argument to why IQ is important. Uh, he, another one he talks about is uh, general intelligence seems to also improve health and longevity, uh, even correcting for other things. So like if you correct for class and wealth and and uh, even genetic factors, it improves it by a decent margin, which is interesting. So like the the kind of the hypothesis he posited forward after presenting the data on that. Uh, was that okay? So if you're if you're a, a brainlet, if you're a retard, you're gonna get uh, into stupid situations more often, and then those stupid <laughs> situations are more likely to kill you more often. 
And that's besides just like, you know, like a, a smart person taking care of their health or not taking care of their health. It's more like it, like you're going to be a funny statistic he talked about was like they measured um, like the intelligence and then the, the, the death rates of, of like Swedish veterans or something. And uh, the ones who were stupider had like a much higher chance of getting murdered or dying in accidents. So so if you're brainlit, if you have a low IQ, you're like you're literally going to die in accidents or get killed because you're just going to be in stupid situations more often, which is funny. I, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah. And it makes common sense as well. I, I mean, it's there's nothing weird about it. And then and then at the end of the chapter, he, he cites that classic uh, shitposting study about how uh, if you have a higher IQ, it leads to more liberal beliefs and such. Uh, and he's like, oh, this is even if you correct for social class. But but I, I think that's it's kind of a farce because because really uh, and I, I've, I've talked about this in other subjects, but the, the current sort of liberal neoliberal belief is it's ubiquitous in media, in uh, schooling and in academia and all these things. It's sort of the the upper echelon. So if you're a smart person, you want to be you want to be good with the upper echelon. You want the upper echelon to like you. You want to reflect their ideas. You want to do all these things. It doesn't even matter. Correct. Yes, you want to be politically correct because of the social and material benefits if you're smart. Uh, so I, I, there'd have to be some other uh, addendum to the study to sort of measure, okay, so there's a biases in the upper class of society already or, or sort of the, the saturation effect. So like all the things you read in the news, all the media studies, you, I mean, all the studies you do in school, all the teachers you talk to, if they're all liberal and they believe liberal beliefs, and I believe people believe liberal beliefs simply because that's what the elite want. Like, like if you really take, take a, a liberalism and put it down on paper, it's just like a, a smorgasbord of random shit that the elite want you to believe because it makes them more money. Uh, and and so if so if you just take try to get that bias somehow out of the study and there's a few ways I think you could do it you could like measure uh, like the saturation effect of different political beliefs and try to isolate that uh, then then it might be more accurate so it's so sort of like saying the most intelligent people in Catholic Europe were Catholic monks and, and that's like no shit uh, the most intelligent people in in neoliberal capitalist world are neoliberals yeah. So I, I think it's sort of a non-study, although he, he also says it's kind of a, a weak finding. But yeah, I was just commenting on that. And then the, um, let's see, what else? Yeah, so, so I guess summing that up, it's uh, the, the study, if they're going to say, oh, if you're smart, you're going to be a lip cuck, uh, you'd have to sort of isolate, is the intelligent person doing it for convenience? Are they doing it for social benefit and convenience? Or are they doing it because they actually analyze the ideas and that's what they believe. And you'd have to really get at that before you could really say that as a, as a comprehensive study. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, kvetching about that a while, but I, I think it needed to be said. Uh, all right, chapter four, the author talks about, oh, did my audio? Are you just really quiet, Sven? I mean, I'm oh, no, straight it, never up mind. against the microphone now. Okay, it's good, it's good. All right. Uh, I thought it like, cut out I mean, for I a second. I can't get closer, you're, but you're... then it's going to get intimate. Mm. All right. <laughs> uh, chapter four. What's going on in chapter four? Uh, let's see. Uh, the biology of intelligence. All right. Yeah. Um, all the... Rip Jeff, all that IQ doomed to be a weed. Does the book mention... I'm going to read chat real quick before we move on. Uh, does the book mention the correlation between higher IQ and the smaller PP you have? It does mention that there is a no correlation between IQ and um, and being uh, extroverted, so it kind of doesn't help you at all having a high IQ. Both guest volumes seem to be like one third of yours. I mean, yeah, they're lower. I mean, I could turn myself down. I can't really turn them up too much higher. Want me to turn myself down? Would that like please you? I could do that. Um. All right, so chapter four, the author talks about uh, sort of the biology behind it, um, the uh, sort of like the brain evolution. The, the, so he, all, a lot of the chapters here are kind of weak, like the, the evolution stuff, like he doesn't really say anything. Kind of skims over. Yeah, he's yeah. just like, well, uh, our brains got bigger as we developed. That's kind of all he says. It's kind of stupid. Uh, kind of unrelated, uh, kind of related to that point, I watched a different documentary 
on um, on sort of anthropology and and sort of archaeological findings for our ancestors. And what what actually they found is that if you look at uh, your stream is just giving feedback. Yeah, but I'm saying would would that improve your audio experience if I turn myself down? That's what I'm asking. Yes or no question. Um, the let me think. The uh, so the the archaeological we need old mic. We need old mic. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the sort of archaeology says that if you look at humans who are pre-civilization, so like Paleolithic, 30,000, 40,000 BC humans and, and before that, they actually have bigger brains than now. So humans now have smaller brain cases by a good margin. And that's uh, the, the sort of anthropologist muse that the, the reason was, well, if you're, if you're playing real life, turn off the stream. It'll improve everything. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. All right. Mean. Yeah. The, my chat wants the the bully me like Ant Cat, but they'll quickly find it's impossible. I, it can't. It can't happen. They'll, they'll they try though because they, you know, they they miss <laughs> Ant Cat. Like challenge the I know, people. right? It's... They they miss Ant Cat, so they'll they'll try. We all do. I <laughs> yeah, I miss Ant Cat too. I wish Ant Cat was here to talk about IQ and how big brain nibbles and stuff would be great. Oh, well. <laughs> he would even read this book. It's not that long. Uh... Yeah, he probably could have read it. Uh, all right. So the so what they found was that people had high, bigger brains, more uh, bigger skulls with more room in them before civilization came around, uh, and and this is pretty uniform. And that uh, they theorized that since you're playing real life Minecraft, you're playing Rust IRL, and you have to like be wary of all these dangers and constantly survey your surroundings and remember what plants are bad and what plants are good. And how to build a boat, and how to build a fucking hatchet, and all these things, and you, and you're, you got to remember all of this shit, and constantly be on the move, and constantly, uh, you know, know all the animals that could be a danger to you. Uh, then yeah, you're gonna need a bigger brain, and you're gonna need more cognition, being a hunter gatherer. Uh, and then civilization, like everything's kind of solved for you, or a lot of things are. So you need, you don't really need a big brain. So it's kind of shrunk over time, which is interesting. Kind of, kind of goes over the. Um, uh, what should we call it? The 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 sort of hypothesis the the author posits. I mean that that's only in late development though, because if you go back to the uh, proto, what do, you, what do you call them? The proto humans. Yeah, so it's sort of it, yeah. it builds yeah. up to yeah, Homo sapiens. It builds up to Homo yeah. sapiens, and then from so ancient Homo sapiens have bigger brains than current day Homo exactly. sapiens. Exactly. Exactly. Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the earlier ones had smaller ones. Yes. Yeah. All right, so then the the author admits that intelligence is directly heritable from parents with a high correlation. And so he talks about all that and how all the studies say, like, basically 50% or even up to 80% in, in adulthood, that uh, your intelligence is tied to your, uh, your how smart your parents were, almost, like, to a T. And that uh, outside of, like, extreme stuff, like fetal alcohol, shit or like being like punched in the face a lot or, or being abused or completely neglected your iq is going to remain the same like you, you can you can push it like one or two points but it's not you can't really do much to it it seems uh, is what the literature it was says. most amiable in the early years too it's, it's when you get older it's gonna it's gonna well yeah but the thing is like yeah. the the literature shows that even with like a bunch of like positive up upswing in the early years um it doesn't really affect you like you're gonna you're gonna kind of baseline back to your parents iq well yeah that, that was what yeah. i meant yeah that was yeah exactly even even if you get like a huge like you're listening to mozart you're, you're reading uh, Nietzsche at age six or something. Like, like you're gonna go back to baseline at by by adulthood. Yeah, they uh, addressed the Mozart thing, uh, which I thought was. Hang on, uh, they addressed the Mozart thing, which I thought was interesting because, uh, like, when you're listening to Mozart, it doesn't make you smarter. It's just like complex music, and it's just stimulating your brain, kind of like pre-workout. Yeah. Pretty workout for your brain. Basically, so, the author doesn't really find that, that part of the anything brain. really increases IQ, which is well, I think that's another chapter later on. Uh, all right. So after talking about nature, he he uh, he like is very adamant about oh, high IQ is heritable. All the data says it's heritable. Your parents and your genes determine how high your IQ is, and it's like set in stone. And this is the way it is. At least fifty percent of it's determined by by your parents and your genetics. And then uh, in the, like the later chapters, like oh, but that doesn't mean race is race has gen a heritable IQ. Don't it doesn't That's it doesn't trickle the down. Real shit post title. <laughs> yeah. The easy way to raise your IQ. <laughs> yeah. All 
All right. Uh, so yeah, so he sort of like defends race realism despite like hating it, which is funny. Uh, the author then talks mm -hmm. about um, sort of the different things that that could lead to improving IQ and sort of the nurture sphere, which is sort of early nutrition, early education, other things. But it, but yeah, once again, like the sort of data shows that. On average, it doesn't matter what happens as long as you're not getting like fucking beaten the head of a baseball bat or, or drinking at age <laughs> six or, or doing a bunch of drugs. You'll probably be okay, and you're going to go back to baseline IQ by adulthood. Um, so yeah, so that's what they found is that even even the educational stuff. So if you get someone in like an accelerated program early on, and they get really uh, like like brain boosted by all the 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 schooling. Uh, even that, it's gonna it like drops off like a rock right after puberty into adulthood. So, so it really is like mostly genetic. Um, and then he talked about sort of the the genetic uh, studies, uh, the, the trying to find the smart gene, as it were. But then the geneticists kind of found that uh, intelligence is a shit ton, like a, like a huge network of different genes. Polygenic is what he says. Uh, yeah. So there's many different genes that affect intelligence and interact with each other and sort of synthesize and desynthesize and uh, determine how good or bad you are at intelligence. So it's not there's not like a smart gene. You can't like edit your own genes to be smarter. You're going to go. It's like a very complex system that people don't understand yet, and they're still studying it. Um, and then he talks about in in the last part, sort of uh, an analysis of the physical brain, kind of like how the uh, the the introduction clip. Uh, where they they take brain scans and they do this thing called the diffusion tensor technique that sort of measures the uh, the white matter uh, measurements and white matter is sort of how uh, the connected tissue of your brain and so how efficiently connected your brain is uh, sort of like uh, how efficient your processor is and that like this is a physical thing that can be measured and like uh, people will have different uh, white matter amounts that will that physically differentiates how good and how smart they are uh which is interesting and he talked about some of that and yeah, yeah I, th I thought it was specifically interesting he, he talked about how people with higher iqs had lesser activity when they were solving issues so yeah so it's more like a yeah, it's more, it's more efficiency than it is um yeah. mass so so exactly. it's like how well your brain is wired rather than uh so, so don't, don't do drugs kids stay don't drink <laughs> Just Whoops. wait, wait until you're, yeah, yeah. Wait know, until right? you're 21. <laughs> wait, wait, if you're an American, I guess. But if you're, if you're not an American, just like do it lightly after you turn of age. Just, just give it some time. Get, give your brain some time to develop. I know I'm, I, I'm smarter probably not because I'm like some fucking smart genes, but probably just because I didn't fucking drink to like blackout in school. That's probably why I'm smarter than other people. Because if I, I know the majority of my fucking peers, like we're just druggy degenerates in high school and probably <laughs> fucked their entire brain chemistry throughout high school and college. So it's just, just let it down. Just put down the drink. Put the weed down. Just let, let it grow. And then you can go enjoy that later when, once you're in the decline. Once you're past 25, it doesn't really fucking matter so you can fuck your brain. But, but just let, let, you, let it grow, okay? All right. Um, chapter 5 uh, talks about the... Let's see. Oh yeah, chapter five is the 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 funny one, right? The uh, yeah, how to yeah, how to raise how to, your IQ, the easy way. <laughs> so, so the easy way to raise your IQ, and so he says like, oh well, I'm just baiting you. This chapter title, I can't I can't really tell you any way to raise your IQ. But then he opens the chapter with something that I found really fucking funny, which was he says, all right, so if uh, I let's imagine a nation, and if we raise the IQ of the country by five all these great things would happen in this country. Like all, all these like social and health benefits, all these great things would happen. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> he's basically saying, uh, deport black people. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not even wrong. I mean, he's not saying like the crazy, incredible things would happen, but he does go into It'd be great. Like, even the slightest amount of increase would would uh would save a lot of people's lives. Yeah, all these people would live longer. They'd be healthier. There'd be less crime. Look at all these things that would great things that would happen if we could just raise people's IQ by five points. Hmm, makes you think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So so sort of somewhat uh, unknowingly, he's sort of laying uh, kind of what he does all the book is, is he's saying, oh, race realism. You're basically right, but I can't say that. Get rid of the Congo man. <laughs> All right, and then after that, he sort of talks about okay, well, there's there's like nootropics and things. There's 
uh, you could maybe take all these, there's these different chemical research and, and these products being sold and all those things being done. If, oh, if you take this, your brain's going to get a boost. You're going to get a brain boost eating this shit. And, and then he says, like, well, maybe we have to do drug tests for children going, taking tests. Uh, and I found that kind of funny because, like, if you, def you it probably would have to do that in college considering I would imagine at least 60 to 70 percent of people in tests are on fucking Adderall. Um, either on in test or or while studying are doing Adderall, at least at my college campus that they were. It's kind of fucking crazy. It's so crazy to hear that that's that's I know for a fact that's not at all going on in at least in Denmark. Uh, yeah, in, in the U.S., uh, everyone's fucking swapping Adderall. Addies, uh, get get Addied, bro. Yeah, it's oh bad God. in the U.S. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, fucking mutts. I wonder, I do wonder, like, if all the millennials who are, like, popping Addy during their uh, college days, are, are they going to just, like, be addicted to Adderall all their life, be productive at their job? Or maybe they're just going to be unproductive fucks. Who knows? <laughs> How much does it actually... I mean, it makes you. It yeah, basically but... makes you an autist and able to like focus on things, and so yeah. uh, for people, for uh, I guess uh, millennials, if you use it right. It, it's probably yeah, but also it it'll out. fuck your brain chemistry and, and lead to long term dependency, and it's basically methamphetamine. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's it not makes a good you stay idea. up all night to cram for tests because you didn't yeah. study at all. I mean, I just cram for tests Fun. without Adderall, like a like a normal person. <laughs> Create the hypno state. All right. <laughs> Oof. Just All right. Listening to J-pop raise your so, IQ. I wish. <laughs> the the author uh, uh, cites the the often cited point that breastfeeding will lead to higher IQ. But then he, he oh, yeah, talks that's about the one Stefan Molyneux likes the Stefan like, Molyneux meme, and I, I've heard other yeah, people yeah, yeah. who are like nat all into the natty shit, like oh, it's all natty, bro. It's all natural. The breastfeed. Uh, it, they did some follow-up studies and found that if you really control for stuff, it doesn't really do much. It's more so that there is a there is a lurking variable effect where if, if someone who's smarter and more conscientious is going to breastfeed their kid because they under because there are health benefits like physical health benefits to breastfeeding. So if someone's smarter, they'll breastfeed their kid, and that's why their their kids are smarter, not because because uh, they breastfed them. I, there's probably like some minor effect, but it's not like huge. You're not going to lose five or ten it, points it's not that whole you know two one to two points like, a year thing okay. yeah it's like it's maybe like one to two points overall if you were breastfed or not like at best according to the data all right uh and then he talked about uh the schooling effect and and so he says oh well there's all these schooling effects but not really he kind of uh, like undermines his own point he he says that you can do all these things in school, and then if you get to the kids in school early on, but we don't really know how. We don't really know how it works. We just know school good. And uh, if you go to school, a high IQ. And <laughs> he, he says that, like, no matter what they do, like, if they do the advanced, like, uh, high placement stuff, like the, the super fast training thing, uh, like, it all just kind of plummets back down. There's not really a, a figured out method of raising children's IQ in school. Uh, but he sort of summarizes, and then he talks about, after that, he talks about the Flynn effect. So the Flynn effect is that, like, every year IQ raises by three points on average, uh, although the data is reversing now, which is funny. Uh, I think when he wrote this, <laughs> yeah. when, when, he wrote, funny. when he wrote this, the data was, like, all upswing, and then in the last, like, you know, like, six, seven years, it's been on a, on a pretty much of a downturn in the U.S. Uh, and he's like, hmm... I wonder why that's happening. Hmm, look at the demographics. Yeah, hmm. Hmm. Uh, nothing to see here, Nothing boys. to see here, guys. Uh, yeah, so he, the more updated, I think, I don't remember when he wrote this, like 2012, 2013, 11, something like that. Uh, uh, it's sort of, the data's countered him a bit. Uh, IQ is actually declining now in the U.S. and some other developed countries. Uh, especially in the countries that are hit by the immigration crisis, IQ kind of took a fucking plummet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the uh, and, and so the Flynn effect's kind of been disproven more recently, or it's or it's it's on shakier ground, much shakier ground than when the author wrote this. And he sort of says, "Oh, well, the Flynn effect must be because our schooling, our schooling's causing the Flynn effect of three points per year," uh, which I I don't think so. And and then there's the the other um, thing, which is. The Flynn effect, it, can't, it, could all, it could be schooling, but it could also be that IQ tests are getting easier, like test takers and, and intelligence measurers are getting uh, softer and more lenient on everybody. Or it could be that uh, the lower end, 
So the, uh, the lower end variance of the IQ distribution is getting higher. And if that is, then the person that then the, the people who are who, like their intelligence didn't increase. They're like, they're just as intelligent, but people are getting dumber. And so their, their relative score will rise by three points a year. So it could be, it could be literally just people are getting dumber. And that's causing the Flynn effect too. He doesn't really talk about that because I think it's too cynical for him because he's trying to point, paint this, uh, this like nice happy picture about intelligence. Um, but yeah, like, like not only uh, could it be that tests are getting easier. I don't know about that. I, I think they, they might be getting slightly easier. Uh, but it could also just be that the, the lower end variance is increasing to, to the lower end of the bell curve. And that just leads to higher IQ for people who were averagely intelligent before. Uh, so yeah, a bit of an oof. All right. And then uh, chapter six is sort of the apologetics chapter. Why is intelligence so controversial? Question. Yeah, she's like, stop. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Someone in chat says, an English professor once mentioned to a class I attended uh, that the mean reading level was fourth grade. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, if you, if you take a, um, a reading test from 1912, like, most kids in school will just fucking fail that shit. Is it, is it like, like, now, I mean, the, there is sort of the sort of the language differences and sort of usage, but it's, like, much more complicated uh, on a whole, and uh, people were actually better at reading in the past. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely do not think the Flynn effect is real. I don't think IQ is raising. I think there's definitely uh, sort of some some sweeping aside of what the reality is for that one. So it's something to do with uh, skin color. <laughs> I, I don't know. Something to do with genetics. Genetics, yeah, the genetically heritable IQ. Yeah, something to do with that. I don't know. Uh, all right. Um, so chapter six, he talks about all the controversies that, that Libcucks like to complain about when it comes to intelligence. So he says, intelligence tends to get a bad rap by modern liberals because of the old association with the eugenics movement and advocates who insisted that social class and intelligence were immutable. These same liberals seek an equality of opportunity. And if they admit that intelligence is real and in large part genetic, their quest for equality uh, is, fails. So that's why they, no matter, even if like the data is clear, Someone who who has this sort of quest for a block quest for equality mindset, they're never going to be able to admit it because then they have to give up their quest because you can't be equal if people are just like immutably different uh, intelligently. Like you just can't uh, you can't have equality then. All right, and then he talks about the the difference between the sexes. So women tend to have a slightly lower score, but are on average more intelligent. Uh, like the av the average mean intelligent woman woman is more intelligent. And then men have higher uh, presence in detail. So you can have like a, a total like 40 IQ retard Danga. And then you can have like a <laughs> 170 IQ like fucking savant. Uh, what's a good savant person? I don't know. Uh, fucking Stephen Hawking? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so you can, you can have like a savant or retard in the male side. And so we have much bigger distribution on the tails. And so I thought this was important to point out. Uh, because basically it means uh, if you're, if you're a, a fucking... Wife, if you're searching for your waifu and you're thinking, ah, oh, I'm gonna find this autist, like 130 IQ girl who's gonna like, we're gonna really get each other. Uh, just stop, all right? Yeah, you're, no. you're not gonna find them. They're they're yeah. they're like finding a unicorn in a needle in a haystack. Uh, you're, it, on average, and the ones that are up there, probably not. I mean, there 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 are the few like power women, the executives and what have you. Yeah, they're not gonna be looking. And I've I've met a few women who are smart, but they're few and far between. And uh, you, you should just uh, get an average girl and then just, you know, just teach her things that are smarter than normie shit. That's what you got to do. Slate. Get a slate. Put some, <laughs> put some smarter shit than normie shit on there and just live with it. It's what you got to do. It's kind of what the data points to. Just live with that, all right? Uh, <coughs> and, okay, what else? All right, so the author, uh, so then he gets to the race, race chapter, which was the funniest chapter, I think. Um, so he says, uh, we just don't know about race. Like, just because race, just because gene uh, IQ is inheritable, we don't know if it, like race or, or there's like group heritable IQ. We just don't know. There's just no studies on it. And it's just too much of a taboo. So we haven't studied it at all. And so he's basically covering his own ass here and saying that, oh, we just don't know. Uh, we, we can't say, and anyone who says it's like a bigot, uh, but obviously if, if, if fucking IQ is heritable and then there's different, uh, genetic, uh, intelligent distributions among races, then, then 
races have different intelligences. It's, it's that simple. And uh, uh, sadly, he kind of defends the point all throughout his book, despite not wanting to defend it, which is kind of funny. Um, but I, I, do, I do appreciate that at the end of that chapter, he's like, well, if, we, if it wasn't so taboo, we could actually figure out the answer and find it out. He, he sort of complains <laughs> that the, the liberals are stopping uh, them finding an answer to this. Uh, after that, he sort of goes over a general principle that he wishes people would uh, take sort of uh, the IQ data and the, um, uh, the other, like, you know, racial IQ and all these other things. Just let, let us figure out the data and then don't, uh, don't, like, suppress it out of fear. It will cause, like, a fucking Nazi movement or something. He says it's, like, stupid that people are going to, like, take the data and then, and then be, like, all crazy with it. Uh, I mean, I, I guess uh, almost the libcucks who are suppressing it are right because uh, even though it's not rational, it's not like, you know, well, just because the data says uh, we have a lower IQ between races doesn't mean we have to, like, go into, like, a segregated society or anything. Uh, and that's true. Um, but, uh, sure. but, but the thing is, like, once that data comes out and if it becomes popular, then that's basically the conclusion people will reach, even if it's not, like, truly by itself rational. So I guess, I, guess, I don't know. Um, the author uh, then talks about the confirmation bias of equality seekers. So like the people who are seeking equality will like go to any length to have these whamby-pamby nonsense uh, excuses. Oh, well, specialized intelligence or, or well, you're, you're like verbally intelligent or you're like spatially intelligent. And they'll, they'll, they don't really care about the data or the truth. They're just trying to protect their beliefs. And they're going to go to like any degree to do it. Um, and then uh, because of that, they can't find the actual answers. And he also complains about the, the sort of the language deconstructionists. So the people are like, oh, what do you mean by IQ? What do you mean by intelligence? So ha ha. I, I, I kind of used that argument before, which is just, you know, because it was funny. But uh, the, uh, and it's not untrue to a degree. Like, like it, there's not like something in, like intelligence is a measured factor. It's sort of a cultural thing that we've built, uh, and I think it is important. Uh, and it is the G factor is a measurable thing, but but our sort of our how much we uh, put how much weight we put on it, and then how important we believe it is. That's just our all of our opinions, and that's kind of arbitrary. But the but the thing it is a factual thing. The G factor, general intelligence, does exist, but our our opinions on it. Is sort of our own thing, and that's like that's sort of up to people's uh, arbitrary distinction. Uh, and so he, he, the author kind of wishes that all these political concerns could be discarded, so people can really find out uh, how intelligence works. All right. And then he ends the book uh, with a little list of reasons to study intelligence. So he says, uh, reason one: intelligence is correlated with positive health effects, and we want to be more healthy and live longer. Uh, I would say Ligotti would disagree with that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, sure. Uh, reason two, he says, age and intelligence suggest that... All right, uh, so like over... As you age, your intelligence decreases and that uh, this should be something we try to solve so people can be more intelligent as they age. Not only because like you don't want dumb old people running things, but because you want... Uh, uh, people to be able to, like, you know, not have Alzheimer's, not have all these other problems, and that studying intelligence in old age will help solve these problems, which I agree. I think that's a fair reason. Um, uh, number three, he says, intelligence helps institutions function better and do more, and it's socially important, so we should study it and figure out how to raise intelligence because it's good and helps society. So he's like, yeah, let's be more intelligent. Uh, and then four, it's kind of just like, I like studying intelligence. That's like, he says, I like it, basically. This is fourth reason. <laughs> uh, he just thinks it's interesting for people who are intelligent to study intelligence. Like, oh, isn't that funny? Uh, all right, and that's, and that's basically the book. So, curiosity. so the guy's just like a, a, a normal academic, just, you know, is an academic. He's liberal beliefs, studying things, presenting the data. You know, just presenting the data in a scientific, mostly impartial way. Uh, but I just found this book funny besides the, the data is good it's a good introduction to intelligence and I recommend if anyone like wants the, the, the talking points if they, if they want to argue about intelligence this book's pretty good about pulling up all the different studies and the different facts about it um, but one thing well, I found you want a starting point to find if you want to go into the field it's uh, the book ends out 
with the with the which a large section of uh, literature go through. Yeah, he he has a ton of well different sorted. suggestions about what to read if you're more interested yeah. in yeah. Both, studying uh, intelligence. People who you know, critiques and you know the science of it and yeah, it, it's a good list. Yeah, and and one the thing I found the funniest about the book was the the sort of the neoliberal undercurrent. So sort of like even despite him not liking uh, the sort of the liberal politics of things. Like he doesn't like it. He wishes it went away so he could study intelligence more objectively and be more scientific. He, but he like he falls to it. He like he has to slide in constant apologies and constant allusions. Like oh, I'm not saying we should there should be any eugenics. I'm not saying that. Don't, don't worry about that and, and all these other things. And it's, it's just kind of funny to me. Like reading, like, like I think this book it sort of reads like a wimp. It sounds like yeah, a wimp. Uh, like it. A lot it of the, uh... <laughs> I think and this book is, if you ever want to see like what, what the neoliberal bias looks like, uh, you would read this book because he's struggling throughout the book to, to not uh, to present all this information that goes against the neoliberal bias, but he still has it in the book. He's still very uh, neoliberal belief biased in the book all throughout, and he's, he's constantly sliding that in. So you can see sort of the, the ideological uh, uh, nonsense that sort of modern academia is up to. It's like no matter how objective you are, you just can't be objective anymore. And that's and this is why I was kind of disgusted with schooling in general these days. It's just like like no matter what you do, what you study. I mean, I guess intelligence is a particularly contentious issue. But no matter where you go, you're going to have to toe the party line. You're going to have to play and, and avoid all these taboos, which are really endemic. And important to explore about knowledge and living and like society and life and you have to avoid all these taboos no matter what you study and that then that scholarship's really kind of stopped and even even this book which i think is very scholarly i think it's it presents the information really well i think it's pretty uh pretty objective like even this book is tainted by it and uh i, I just found it kind of interesting right yeah, he, I mean, he, he even slightly poo-poos on the on the bell curve when he talks about the whole race thing. If I yeah, correctly. Yeah. But meanwhile, while like the, all the other parts of the book support the bell curve and genetic heritability and all these other things, <laughs> he's just, right because it's based on the science. <laughs> he's just like, oh, but, but I'm not saying that. I'm not I'm not saying that the race is the not. It's, it's just kind of pathetic. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and it, it kind of just plays into the my hypothesis I have about the whole thing, which is that the the elite, the, the culture formers of the elite who fund all the different academics and they fund the media, all the different publications, and they fund the uh, the broadcast media and and the the art and the culture, they have the the set of beliefs which is called liberalism, and they'll push it down on you, and it's just kind of this this Victorian goofy nonsense that people follow. There's not any logic or reason behind liberalism. It's a sort of an assembly of random beliefs that don't have any coherent uh, structure. And uh, it, it's sort of a tainted. Of, a lot of it's just completely not in line with reality. Well, I mean, not even that. It's just that, like, it's not internally logical. There's not really a thrust to it. It's just sort of, oh, well, we want open immigration, but we also want free trade. But we also want uh, low prices on things. But we also don't want workers to be abused. It's just like a, a pile mm -hmm. of nonsense, really. It's just like whatever uh, is popular and, and that the elite allow you to talk about. And that, that's basically all liberalism is. Um, and, and it sort of taints academia. It's kind of sad. But I think, I guess, no matter what sort of academic era you study or what, like, what you're reading from, there's going to be biases. There's going to be political biases. But it's just not very open anymore. It's all very uh, dyed in this, this very narrow, nonsensical worldview. All while acting like they're still underdogs fighting for truth and justice, yeah. Like, isn't it ridiculous? That's like, oh, we gotta, we gotta BTFO those like Westboro Baptist Church Church Evangelicals because they're like they're gonna like fuck up society, bro. No, they're like like uh, an extreme twenty people who like go to protests that nobody cares about, and and like there's no media produced like that, and, and it's all like the opposite. Like, even though they've won, they are they still think they're like the Rebel Alliance. It's so fucking cringy. So fucking Harry Potter and Star Wars pill. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this book was was fun. Uh, we we talked about a lot about intelligence. We're gonna talk about another book that uh sort of underpins liberalism. Well, I, I guess the, this book doesn't underpin liberalism. It actually kind of uh destroys liberalism a bit. Kind of Ben Shapiro's them. 
because all the data on intelligence kind of destroys the worldview. Uh, but the next book we're going to be talking about next week is uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, kind of a famous nonsensical book that got cited as basically uh, the success of civilizations is all environmental. It's all environmental. There's no genetic differences. There's no biological difference. It's all it's just guns, germs, and steel, bro. They just got lucky. They just fucking luck sacked the, their their civilization <laughs> start. Yeah, like they they started a game of Civ Five, and they just had like all the great tiles around them, and they just kind of like, haha, we win. Uh, that, that's basically all yeah, that's basically the hypothesis of uh, guns, germs, and steel. And so we'll be talking about that. It's often cited by libcucks and people defending the 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 liberal ideology, and, and we'll we'll talk about how. Uh, we'll read it and go over some of its nonsense. Uh, were you going to read that one, Psych? Uh, I am reading it, but I probably won't be done by next week. Okay. So. Roots were, was talking about reading it. Okay, we'll we'll see who's read it. By I, I only need like one person. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I'll but try yeah. to make it for Friday. But if we could make it Sunday, I'm. I'm yeah, we can push it back. Uh, I, I had it on Friday, uh, just because in case Roots wanted to join. But we can definitely if Roots didn't. If Roots uh, finishes the time, we might have it on Friday. If he doesn't, we can push it back to Sunday. We'll see. Yeah, I'm going to uh, try to finish know. it. If it's Friday. on Sunday, I'm not going to be able to show up. Guns, Germs, and Steel isn't it entirely incorrect. Oh, yeah, it does go over some like real factors of like uh, European success. But yeah. I, I think it, it, it definitely is it's very preachy, and it, it's pushing an angle, a very specific political goofy angle, and doesn't really look at all the information. And we'll go over why that is. And then so that's another book that's sort of tinged by neoliberalism that we'll talk about. Uh, so yeah, thanks for tuning in. I know it's a, it's a shorter book, so it's a shorter show. Uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, wait a minute. Book review on Bibble when Chow asks. Book review on the Bibble? I'm not fucking uh, reading that shit. <laughs> uh, get Leo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, before we end this thing, I have that my copy pulled up. Do you guys want to talk? About oh yeah, yeah, let's do that. That's, that's, a, that's a great way to end the show. Uh, yeah, okay, let's do that. Uh, let me pull up the, the page. All right, so uh, I, could, I guess I could pull it up on screen. Right, let me do that. Uh, let me change the... Uh, I guess I'll just change the Discord. All right, yeah. Uh, let me uncrop it. Edit, transform, reset. Okay. All right, so here's here you should be able to solve this dot jpeg. Um, here's a, a little question. Uh, number one, we've got a little, we've got a, a a quadrilateral. It's white, and then it's black, and then it's half white, half black. Then we got a circle. It's white, it's black, it's white, and half black. Then we got a square. It's white, it's black. What's the next pattern? What's the answer, guys? I'll say it on three. One, two, three. E. Oh, you, you guys know, you know it's, like it's F. F for the for number one. For number one, yeah. No, it's E. Oh wait, you're, you're right. It's it's F. Yeah. Never mind. Fuck. Shit. BTFO. I BTFO'd myself. Yeah. I I confused myself. Okay, it's F. You're right. Uh, I I got this the optical illusion. BTFO me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> confirmed. <laughs> confirmed. Twenty IQ, Jeff. All right. All right. For the for the second one. The second one. Uh, all right. We got we got the squares in the line. We got the squares in the circle. We got the line in the circle. We got the circle in the line. The circle in the triangle. The triangle in the line. The square in the circle. The triangle in the square. And then we have a blank. So this one's a lot harder to solve. What's the answer? I'll let. let how about uh, somebody clip that? <laughs> yeah, you guys are gonna clip that. All right. What's the answer? Uh, what does chat think the answer is for number two? I'll let, I'll let some people in chat answer before we, we end the stream here. <laughs> yeah, they have... Jesus, Jeff. I know. <laughs> Fucking F, dude. I, I avoided it subconsciously because everyone says F all the time. I don't want to say oh, F because it's like a meme. Yeah. It, was, it was all... I got... I debated myself. Yeah. All right, so chat... Uh, Nazim says B. Uh, someone else says B. Chow says Z. <laughs> Good answer. Highest IQ answer. Is this Chow. some sort of autismo test? It's easy. Uh, what do you guys say? I say oh. it's B. B. 
That's B. All right, it's B. Okay, you guys, you guys solved it. Good job. Although, uh, it, it's thank in, you. If uh, <laughs> Nazim didn't answer correctly first, we might have seen some different answers, right? Uh, well, no, I. It's it's in the end of the um, uh, chapter. It's uh answer to it. Oh well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you could have looked at oh, that. Oh, you mean in chat? You mean? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the chat might have got it wrong if I seemed didn't get it right first. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess that was fun, kind of, not really. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is a fun little stream about IQ and shit. Next week we'll be doing guns, germs, and steel. It'll be like a little shit post about guns, germs, and steel. Uh, fun book, I guess. See you next week. Bye. Where's my knife? There it is. See ya. <laughs>